Adventure. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Lorena Aldana. Lorena works for the task force in charge of the implementation of the European Year of Cultural Heritage at the DG Education and Culture of the European Commission. 2018 is the European Year of Cultural Heritage. The slogan is Our Heritage, where the past meets the future. Yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for the invitation and for uh, giving me this space to explain the year. And uh, it's, uh, it's something I am very much passionate about because I've been working in this project for the last two years. And so I'm, uh, I'm very excited uh, about this. So first of all, the European Year of Cultural Heritage is, um, let's say, a one-year framework um, dedicated entirely to Europe's cultural heritage with three objectives. First of all, raising awareness, of course, so uh, particularly um, among citizens and among, uh, uh, among uh, people. So raising awareness, also uh, leaving a policy legacy, because of course it's a work that intends not only to, not only to, to remain as, as events, but also setting, setting the ground to, to future um, initiatives on cultural um, heritage and invite, of course, to engagement and participation. So this is the, these are the, the three objectives of the year. And the way to achieve these objectives during this year is through the events organized across Europe. Yes, that's one of the that's one of the ways we have events, but we also have uh, projects. So let's say long term long term projects, and um, so basically we are doing this through three three different uh, in three different ways. So first of all, as you said, events. Uh, of course, there have been over six thousand. Uh, events organized just in the first uh, six months of the year, 6,300 all across Europe. Um, we also have, we also launched a communication campaign. As I said before, this is main, this is uh, mainly a, a raising awareness uh, exercise. So we also have a, a communication campaign. And the third, uh, let's say, stream of the work are our projects. So projects on cultural heritage and through different angles, uh, not only cultural heritage um, as, as a sector, but also in collaboration with other sectors like uh, research, for instance, uh, social innovation and cultural heritage, uh, sustainable cultural tourism and so on. Europe is very rich in cultural heritage. It almost accounts for half of UNESCO's World Heritage List. But it's such an abstract term. What is cultural heritage? Could you please tell us a bit more about the types of events that we've had and we keep having this year? They revolve around what type of cultural heritage? Yes, yes. Uh, the, this... Cultural heritage in the frame of the of the year of cultural heritage is really a broad concept. So this is one of the first messages of the year, actually. One of the most important messages that we're trying to convey is that cultural heritage is not only stones and rocks or churches and monuments, but it's also, uh, it's way more than that. Uh, and it, it, um, it comprises a wide range of resources, for example, intangible, natural, even digital heritage. So this is, uh, uh, this is the, 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 the type of cultural heritage that we are trying to, to promote, a very wide and open concept. People are very important in the European Year of Cultural Heritage. Communities, the community's identity are central concepts in the year. So it's not all about the old rocks or the traditional dances. It's really about the people and how the heritage binds us together. I would like to ask you a little bit how you reach out to those people for, for whom the connection between the heritage in all its forms and our identity as a community, as a whole, might not be obvious especially children and young adults that will become the guardians of the heritage. 
Yes, 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 of course. Uh, first of all, uh, well, I said before, the first important message of the year is that cultural heritage is more than you think. So meaning not only rocks, but also uh, tangible, intangible, etc. Another important message is also that we are trying to highlight how uh, cultural, there are different layers of cultural heritage going from the most local, for instance, uh, in your own town, your, the cultural heritage around you, then your national cultural heritage going to also another layer, which is the European uh, cultural heritage. So this is also a key idea that we are, we, are, we are trying to promote. And we are trying to help people to find these connections, not only because the local, you, your local heritage is it's, uh, right there next to you and you're growing up with this and this is very evident but it's it's a, a bit harder for people to find the european connection so we are we are very much focusing on this on this european dimension of cultural heritage and it can it can be uh, to to reply more directly to your question is about storytelling i would say and about finding these connections and finding a way to communicate uh, um, this you mentioned that about 6,000 events have been organized just in the first six months of 2018. Can you give us other figures just to get an idea of the size of the magnitude of uh, this initiative? How many countries participate, etc.? Yes, okay, so of course uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage begin for member states, uh, so for 28 countries, 28 countries are participated, participating, they have appointed national coordinators, most generally from the ministries of culture, but not only. Um, and so this this was uh, initially then uh, the success it starting to started to let's say exceed the expectations and we have now also associated countries so not only not only EU member states are participating to the year we also have the, for instance Western Balkans um, associated to, to to the year so uh, Albania Serbia they have appointed national coordinators also to run. Uh, activities and then um, we are also counting with um, the support of EU delegations abroad which are let's say the embassies of the European Union all across the world and they're also quite engaged with uh, with the year of cultural heritage we have seen events and exhibitions uh, all around the world for instance, there is one exhibition in Mexico City, in the main avenue of Mexican City, a photographic exhibition. It's expected to reach 4 million people. So this is also, it's it's quite nice. It, the idea is also um, promoting cultural heritage as a basis for cooperation, in this case, Mexico and the European Union. And we have this kind of events all over the world, in, in Asia, in, uh, in Africa. The year was actually launched in Italy, correct? Yes, the the launch of the year was uh, in December 2017 in Milan. Is uh, the European Cultural Forum, which is uh, an event uh, by by the European Commission, the, the largest uh, event on, for cultural stakeholders, and it's taking place every two years. So this year was very special because we launched the year. Um, but that's not it. This is this was the launch or the kickoff at European level. But of course, also in member states, they have also launched um, the year. So we've had more than 20 events also nationally and in some countries, even regionally. So for instance, in the UK, uh, it was launched by Scotland, by the different... Uh, it was launched in London as well. Uh, so England, uh, Scotland, Wales, and, uh, and there were there were different launches. We listen now to an excerpt from the video message that the president of the European Commission, Juncker, sent to the opening ceremony of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, precisely in Milan in December 2017. The excerpt is about two minutes long. Today marks the start of the first ever European Year of Cultural Heritage. Throughout 2018, we will celebrate the cultural diversity that makes our Union so special. From east to west, north to south, Europe's cultural heritage marks our identity, brings people together and attracts millions of people to our shores every year. With 6.5 million directly employed in cultural jobs, it also helps to create jobs and growth in our Union. 
But the year should not be just a celebration. We must also use it to understand our past and to shape our future. 2018 marks 100 years since the end of the First World War and 100 years of independence for several of our member states. I can think of no better symbol or opportunity to learn from our past than this year of cultural heritage. And as Europe debates how to shape its own future, we should not forget that the uniting force that culture can be for our societies. It is a powerful tool for social inclusion. Programs like the EU-funded We Are Roma photo exhibition in Göteborg has shown how culture can bring people together, break down barriers and help to integrate minorities into society. There are many more examples right across our union and this year is opportunity for us to do more. Dear friends, Europe's cultural heritage is all around us wherever we go in our union. We must preserve it, understand what it means, celebrate it and make the most of the opportunities it presents. This is what the European Year of Cultural Heritage is all about. And I'm delighted that this starts now with you. Thank you. This excerpt is taken from the complete streaming of the event, which is available online at an address that we will link in the description of this episode. So, this is a grassroots-based year. It's implemented through a series of initiatives at national, regional and local levels, and it's done thanks to individuals and institutions that actually applied to be part of the year. I have applied too. This podcast is part of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, and so I use the label, I use the slogan, and I use the hashtag Europe for Culture, and I'm actually very proud and very happy about it. I would like to ask you a bit more about the other institutions and individual people who are part of the year, what kind of um, applications you have received, and also how you handle the selection process, because you have received applications from all over Europe, so that must have been a massive moment in the organization of the year. Yes, so how it works is um, it's as it follows. So we as the European Commission, we are granting the label to um, transnational or EU-funded uh, projects. But of course, Europe's cultural heritage is also found in uh, nationally, regionally, in the smallest towns. So for this uh, kind of projects, they are national coordinators granting the label as well. So the, it means that we have the same system of labeling, but it's managed by different uh, authorities, let's say. At European level, we have um, labeled, if I'm not mistaken, five 500, yes, five, 500 uh, projects. And at national level, over 4,000 projects. So these are only the numbers uh, for the first uh, the first six months. So of course we are expecting twice as, as much. 2018 will be over in just a couple of months as we speak. Do you still receive applications? Yes, 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 yes. We receive a uh, hundred uh, this month for instance. Uh, plus all the, the submissions um, in, in member states. Member states are very active uh, also with the labeling process. I'm thinking about, just to give one example, France um, developed an interactive map, an online map in, in which you can go and see which are the labeled projects and see it in the map in which region. And so, so the labeling process is quite successful and we are expecting many more. You mentioned that December will not be the end of this initiative. You want to carry on the message of the year, help trigger real change in the way we enjoy, protect and promote heritage. So what will happen after 2018? Yes. So as I as I said in the in the very beginning, it's not only about events, of course, because events it's maybe just one one off activity, but we are also working in long term events. So 
here in uh, in DG EAC, we launched uh, the 10 European initiatives, which are 10 long-term projects uh, that will, of course, run uh, well beyond 2018. And we are working with different partners uh, within the Commission. Many services are involved. Um, for instance, Directorate for Regional Policy, DG Regio, or for Maritime Policy uh, on Underwater Cultural Heritage, uh, Cultural um, Tourism, and many other topics, and also external partners like UNESCO, for instance, Council of Europe. So we designed this, let's say, work of 10 European initiatives. Each European initiative is tackling one theme. So we have education, heritage at schools, we have youth for cultural heritage, we have innovation for cultural heritage, skills for cultural heritage. So 10 topics that uh, the European Commission has chosen because we consider that, that European action, joint action on these topics is needed and that it will bring an added value. So this was the, the rationale behind these uh, 10 European initiatives. And uh, besides this, of course, there are many, many projects run also in member states because this is a decentralized initiative. And uh, we are also working on a policy, policy legacy for the years to come in cultural heritage. So with all the, the good practices, the good projects, the, all the cooperation that we already put into place, to make it to make it last and to bring it in the, in the years to come so we are also working on that right now policy legacy have you been working already during this year i assume so but do you give yourself a deadline like by the end of december we need everything done and in place and then we keep applying these policies or it will keep being a work in progress and have you concretized some results at least already during this year well, uh, in the new agenda for culture, uh, which is the, the, the let's say the working document uh, for for culture cultural policy in the European Commission, it was already announced that there would be uh, something uh, an action plan for cultural heritage. The, of course, the, the the format and and the, the the type of the document is still under discussion, but definitely there will be something to follow up um, on the year. The European Year of Cultural Heritage has a website, of course, that's europa.eu slash cultural dash heritage. And it's also linked in the description of this episode, of course. And with the hashtag, I assume that one can uh, perform searches on, on Twitter or so. So if I did that, what kind of events would I retrieve? What would I see? Could you name some event that stands out, something that got your attention, something particular? Yes, uh, well, there are the, the there are events uh, being organized uh, from very large and visible uh, events organized uh, by the Commission. For instance, I'm thinking about uh, the the run for cultural heritage race that was held here in Brussels, twenty twenty five kilometers. Um, and this is a, a very a very big event, but also small and local events for instance i'm thinking the one i i like a lot is this uh, uh festival of fish soup in italy uh so this is this is also an example of intangible heritage and basically it's uh, it's all about fish soup and brodetto brodetto festival it's called and we have a long 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 list of events very different uh, we have also um events i'm thinking about upcoming events uh also directed uh, to professionals in the sector workshops um and for the grand grand public as well in in uh, 27th of september to celebrate the european day of languages we had uh, over 70 uh, events all across europe uh, these events are organized by field offices from dg translation so it's the service in the commission that it's in charge of of translation and it's celebrating uh, languages as intangible cultural heritage so this is also uh, uh, an interesting uh, an interesting event Inclusivity is a huge keyword for Europe today. And I think it can apply to the European Year of Cultural Heritage because Europe is rich in history, but it's also changing its face very rapidly with immigration, with new people who settle here. 
first generation, second generation, legitimate Europeans, but they may not find our cultural heritage, architecture, the languages to be their own. Like we look back in the past and it's been our own for centuries and millennia. Is there a specific action within the European Year of Cultural Heritage to uh, give a voice, uh, to reach these people and make them feel included, more welcome, or maybe to merge their heritage with our own so that the face of what the European cultural heritage is will keep shifting as the people of Europe change? Yeah, uh, we do have, we have, I was talking about the 10 European initiatives and within this initiative, so we have 10 big topics and they are structured around four pillars, which are engagement, sustainability, protection and innovation. So under the engagement pillar, we do, we do have uh, projects directed to, uh, to, to, let's say, hard to reach groups for instance uh, meaning the people that are not uh, not close to cultural heritage but also we have a uh, heritage at school for instance also um, tackling this topic uh, youth for cultural heritage as well volunteering opportunities and uh, so we we are we are uh, we are tackling this topic within the basically promoting engagement uh, with cultural heritage and uh, and uh, participation. We listen now to another excerpt from the complete streaming of the launch of the European Year of Cultural Heritage in Milan in 2017. This is an excerpt from the speech of the Commissioner for Education and Culture, Tibor Navracic. The duration of the excerpt is about one minute. This means cultural heritage is not purely an aesthetical phenomenon. It is a politically, it can be a politically very sensitive issue because it always reminds us to our ancestors, to our heroes, to our past, but also to our future. If we can energize those sources of energy of our cultural heritage, we can fund a much brighter future in Europe. And that's why I fully understand those representatives of national minorities who are eagerly protecting their own particular elements, buildings, streets, books, heroes of cultural heritage, because it is really a part of a human identity, a personal identity, but it is a backbone of a community identity. So let it be a backbone of a European identity as well. So there are different layers to cultural heritage. It's the things, it's the knowledge, the intangible heritage, but it's also what it means to us and what we can do with it. So how did you decide to organize the communication campaign within the European Year of Cultural Heritage to put this message out there for everybody in an effective, convincing way. What channels did you choose? What kind of communication strategy you put in place? Communication, of course, we are doing a lot, but we have to tell people about it. So communication is, is uh, very important. We launched uh, also back in December a whole uh, full-fledged communication campaign, including a website, a newsletter every two months. Um, the visual identity of the year, which uh, you you know because you have received the label, so we have this uh, logo uh, in five different colors representing the diversity of Europe's uh, cultural heritage, and people can basically use whatever they they want to, uh, with the, whichever color they want to. Uh, we also have the hashtag Euro for Culture, which is working quite well. This hashtag is also reflecting a. a, a a political uh, compromise is a political statement because it's Europe for culture. So it doesn't have 2018 in it. So it's also reflecting something that that uh, should last longer. Um, then how do we communicate uh, with, with stakeholders and with uh, and the with the general audience? We also have media partners. We are working with Arte TV. Uh, and this is also a great way to uh, to reach uh, a, wider, a wider audience. Um, but I must say, uh, communication our communication budget is really um, 
it's it's not big you know, it's uh 15 16 percent we are not we are using the largest part of the budget in projects uh so for the communication we rely a lot on multipliers and on to spread the word so i would say it's uh i have some numbers here that i would like to to share uh with you uh for instance again media relations we've uh, had almost 5000 uh, media reports published across europe so mentions on the year in uh, newspapers with um, the year has been mentioned, even we had an article in the New York Times, so also well beyond Europe. We had a special supplement in the Herald, and the aggregated uh, online readership uh, exceeds the 5 million uh, people. So this is just uh, some, some numbers on the communication campaign. I think I heard you mention that there was some budget to support some of the project within the European Year of Cultural Heritage. I know that mostly uh, when people, including me, uh, wanted to apply to get the permission to use the label, the logo, etc., uh, we only applied for that, for the permission. So it was not a call for funding. Can you clarify uh, what the year supported financially as opposed to just giving permission to use the label, the logo and the hashtag? Yes, we, we had a, a, a call for proposals for a total of 5 million euros for cooperation projects uh, responding to uh, two objectives, basically. The first one is uh, how can cultural heritage inspire contemporary creation? So cultural heritage uh, for uh, uh, as a as a fuel for creativity, and uh, the second objective is uh, was because the, the the call is closed now. Uh, cultural heritage to foster a sense of European community. So so again, shared uh, identity, shared memories, um, remembrance, and so on. So these were the two objectives, and uh, 26 projects were, were selected and received uh, funding to, to, to develop these projects, and uh, now they will, they will start uh, very soon. I know you're not the initiator of this initiative, but I would still like to ask you if you can tell us a little bit of how this whole thing started. When did it start? How long before 2018? And is it maybe a motivation to celebrate our cultural heritage that binds us together? The fact that there is a need to strengthen the European identity because skepticism is getting more and more popular. So there is this need to emphasize the fact that there is such thing as Europe and our cultural heritage is one, which I'm completely on board with that. I'm pro-Europe very much, but I see around me, of course, in mainstream media discourse that shows how because of the changing face of Europe, our perception of our identity might be fragmented and, in short, weakened. So is one of the motivations to celebrate cultural heritage like this year does also to strengthen the identity of Europe as one? Uh, so first of all, the, the European Year of Cultural Heritage and the attention uh, on cultural heritage uh, in, 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 in the European agenda is not coming from one day to another. This is the result, of course, of years of policy developments and, uh, and policy debate. And so in the, in the past years, uh, the Commission and the, the Council uh, Commission proposed recommendations, Council conclusions on cultural heritage, and it culminates in, in, in the proposal for this year. Of course, as you said before, it is a time of crisis and uh, cultural heritage is something that it's positive, that uh, binds people together, or uh, so it's also a, quite a, a positive, a positive uh, subject and a positive message. So... I believe this is uh, this is also uh, you can also see it like this. But definitely, in the last uh, in the last years, the attention attention for cultural heritage has been growing, and for culture in general, uh, we are moving from a, a union that's only monetary and economic, and realizing that there's 
much more needed to do in terms of integration. So people need really need really to feel closer to each other. And culture and cultural heritage are a wonderful tool to to do this. I couldn't agree more. In fact, cultural heritage matters for Europe in more than just well being there and as we say being part of who we are but it also drives the economy the creative industries are a very strong sector at the moment and resilient to crisis 7.8 million people are directly or indirectly linked to heritage with interpretation or security services so it's also a big part of the european economy This year is the first year of um, cultural heritage. There has not been another in the past, correct? No, no, no. There have been other years before. There was the European Year of Development, the European uh, Year for Solidarity, for instance, as well. Uh, it's not every year, but it's it's again it's a reflection of what's happening in in the political debate and in something a team that wants to be brought to the attention of the public to be debated and to raise awareness. But this is, yes, this is the first year uh, for cultural heritage. After granting permission to hundreds of thousands of people to use the label, the logo, did you do a follow-up to see if it was used correctly or if it was used at all, if it was actually popular as it should have been? Yes, uh, indeed, we we do not we do not follow up at this moment because the thing is it, it it's a it's a decision as well we wanted uh, to be really a, a bottom up process a bottom up process and not only grant uh, the label for instance to big european projects but also to uh, as i said before to small local uh, projects that that might might still be interesting uh, so at this moment also the, the label does not entitle any financial contribution so it's really it's really a way to promote the initiative and to and to multiply the message more than a label of uh, excellence for instance uh, we we do have other kind other kind of initiatives uh, that recognize excellence like the european heritage label the, uh, or 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 the prize uh, eu prize for cultural heritage the label of the year is uh, more uh, in a communication tool so that we can put it out there and and reach uh, more people and of course uh, projects are are showing their support for the year is it possible that there has been an increase in submissions you have received recently so in the summertime probably of 2018 because after the year started people learned about it more because of the communication campaign like the year gained popularity during 2018 with all the events going on rather than a big campaign in 2017 maybe and then by January 2018 we're all ready and we start so because you said you still receive lots of applications now Yes, yes, definitely. And also in, in member states, uh, in, in the different countries, uh, we, we have uh, noticed that, for instance, I think it was in, uh, Slo in Slovakia, if I'm not mistaken, they, they did a, a very big uh, press conference. And basically after that press conference, uh, they started receiving uh, hundreds and hundreds of applications. So, of course, it's, uh, it's kind of a snowball. But after December, people cannot apply anymore. Well, uh, applications will not be open, but people can still use the the label, even though it's, it's after the after the year. Let's go back to when it all started. You said that this this big machine was set up sometime about in 2016. What happened then? And also tell us when you joined the team. When did you get involved with this initiative that you're so passionate about? So in 2016, in August 2016, the Commission, the European Commission presented a proposal for the European Year of Cultural Heritage. But of course, I, how it works, uh, it needs to be negotiated with the Parliament uh, and the Council. So uh, then the, the, the Parliament adopted the decision in April 2017 and the Council uh, in May 
2017. So it was a, a long process of negotiations of uh, the, the, the document that gave birth, let's say, to the year. It's the legal basis. So it's a document with the objectives, with uh, it's setting also the governance of the year and what is it going to happen uh, and so on. So this, uh, this was, let's say, the, the, the birth. This document is... Uh, was the first um, the first block <laughs> that was uh, laid, and as for me, uh, in, uh, in my personal involvement in the in the European Year of Cultural Heritage was two years ago. Uh, so I'm working in this project uh, from the past two years, and uh, and I'm very happy because I've really um, for I am not European. <laughs> to to start with, um, I'm from Mexico, so for me it's uh, super interesting to uh, when I arrived here and I also s I, I saw how is how is it working between the institutions, all these negotiations, the let's say the machinery. Um, it's 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 just a, a great project, and I'm working with people who are very engaged and very passionate about what they do. So so yes, yeah, so I. I love <laughs> my work. If I may ask, what makes you so passionate about this initiative? And even more so now, I'm curious because you told me you're not European. Everything revolves around this concept of European as we're European. It binds us together. So how do you connect with this? Well, uh, first of all, it's a topic that it's very interesting for me. Um, I have a background in uh, culture, cultural studies, cultural management and international uh, relations. Um, so for me, it's, uh, it's very interesting, but also what really... I'm I'm speaking uh, as, uh, as a person and also of the record all... All my, my views are, of course, personal, not uh, from the European Commission. Um, so, so to begin with, the, the topic is very interesting for me. It's also very interesting for me uh, to the whole, the whole concept of, of Europe and the European Union. And as I said before, I'm from Mexico, so I'm coming from uh, a continent, uh, Latin America, in which basically, except for Brazil, we all speak the same language. Uh, we all speak uh, Spanish well, and uh, except some exceptions. Um, but the, the efforts of, of the European Union of really creating a, a political and a economic, of course, and cultural entity for me is, uh, is very interesting. So, so this is also quite um, interesting to see and to be part of this as well. Can you mention some other event or other events that stand out because they are either big or they are funny or they have something special about them? Uh, so the peak of, of the events uh, were really the European um, Heritage Days. Uh, this, the European Heritage Days... Um, are a scheme co-founded by by the by the European Union with the Council of Europe, and it's really very very community based. So basically, what happens is uh, monuments and sites are open for free, and they were also. So many different events organized all across Europe, uh, really from very diverse. For instance, uh, tea and home baking degustation in a castle in Ireland, uh, or uh, a night in the in the museum. So these are uh, these are very uh, very interesting, uh, in engaging events. So for the for the first time, 2018, all the European Heritage Days across Europe adopted the same topic, which was. Share, uh, the art of sharing the European Year of Cultural Heritage. So this was a, a very important contribution. Uh, there were thousands uh, and thousands uh, of events. And uh, and yes, even here in Brussels, uh, Journée Européenne de Patrimoine. In Ireland, it's a week. It's not a Heritage Day, but it's Heritage Week. So, so this is an, a very interesting initiative. Has anything been planned for a grand finale at the end of the year, like a closing event in December or January? Yes, there's going to be a closing conference in Vienna, in Austria, on the 7th of December. 
Uh, that's at European level. Uh, most probably there will also be some events uh, organized by by the countries, by member states. There has been even a mid a midterm event in France, for instance. Uh, it was the kind of sort of evaluation to see what 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 happened during the first half of the year. So we are expecting also some closing conferences or events and. One uh, launch uh, that I, I was present and I really liked was the launch of the year in Belgium. Um, so it was organized, uh, there was a mapping, a video mapping in the Grand Place, uh, which is uh, a listed uh, heritage site. And uh, so the, the, the whole square was lightened, lightened up and there was a performance and everybody could just come and see it. And, and it, was, uh, it was very, very nice. Another launch event uh, that is interesting was in Malta. It was done in a school with the students. So this is also, uh, you know, not the, the, the formal launch with only political figures, but the, 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 it was done in a school. It's also a, a nice message uh, to, to send uh, as uh, highlighting the role of, of the students and, and the kids as the, really the, the guardians of, of uh, cultural heritage. Back to you a little bit. So, Lorena, you're part of the task force for the implementation of the European Year of Cultural Heritage. Your colleagues and yourself, what do you do? What do you do day to day? Yes, so my tasks uh, involve uh, a lot of communication. Uh, so the website, the news for the website, the newsletter, I'm in charge of the newsletter, um, labeling uh, process with the help of my colleague. Um, so yes, I, this is in terms of communication. Then I, I am also contributing to the coordination of, I said before, we have a network of uh, national coordinators. So we have uh, also to manage relations with them. And we are al we also have a group of uh, stakeholders, which are organizations from civil society that are assisting the commission in the implementation of the year. Uh, so, and we have, of course, all people within the European Commission, but working in different, in different fields. So it's a big uh, governance structure that we have to coordinate. We meet them regularly. Uh, so this is uh, also part of, uh, of my tasks. And uh, as I said before, we are, uh, we are a very small but uh, dynamic, uh, uh, the dynamic task force. So, so I, am, I am contributing to, to, to the implementation, communication and also the evaluation of the year because we, of course, we want to know what's happening uh, and, uh, and what's going on. So we are doing a reporting and monitoring and every three months we have a quarterly uh, reporting exercise and uh, in which we, we get to see the, the, the numbers. I assume in January 2019, uh, you will take stock of the situation again and, uh, you know, look back. And what will you look at exactly? Will you count the number of times that the hashtag has been used or the number of visitors to the website? Yes, we have. We are evaluating, for instance, uh, number of events, number of participants to the event, uh, also media relations. So, how many we have a media re a media monitoring in which we look how many mentions, how many times was the year mentioned in newspapers. We also have a social media reporting, uh, for instance, the use of the hashtag, uh, the times where the hashtag was trending. This was the case for, for instance, for the launch in Milano. Um, the, the hashtag was a trending topic uh, on Twitter, along with the Napolitan pizza, which was inscribed in the UNESCO in, uh, list of uh, representative intangible cultural heritage, so where cultural heritage was uh, filling Twitter. And, um, and what else uh, do we have? labeled events I think I mentioned it yes and number of uh, visits to the website which resources are being most downloaded or most visited and this kind of indicators 
Have you ever detected an illicit use of the hashtag? Like somebody did not apply, somebody had an event somewhere, did not ask for permission and still use the label, the logo. Did you check on that? Has it happened? Yes. No. Okay. I'm I'm yes, I'm I'm sure it will happen uh, because you know it's uh, it's in it's in the website. It's easy to get nowadays, you know, uh, just an image. So so probably it will happen but uh yes i think it's a risk that uh the the, the risk is is lower than the the positive the mm -hmm. positive experience yeah. that we've had yes but of course in the in the terms and you, you, of conditions and use of the label it's clearly stated that you should not use it without the permission uh of the european commission and of course, if, if this happens, we, we will contact and, and ask them to remove the label. But to this point, we haven't, we haven't uh, done it yet. I promise I asked for permission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if someone wants to go to the website and look for an event, like a food festival near me, a food festival next week or a concert, an exhibition, or if I'm curious and I want to know if there is another podcast show that has received the label of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, uh, how can we do it? Because I, I went to the website and it wasn't so clear if there is a complete list of events. Probably there's too many. So how does one look for events, in fact, to participate to? Um, the labeled initiatives are not automatically uh showcase in the website this is a common misconception but i mean it's just because as i said before we are labeling hundreds of hundreds of initiatives and events so we cannot put them all uh in the website so in the website what we are trying to do is just highlighting inspiring events or it's just really uh the tip of the iceberg it's just a preview Actually, I know that Technoculture is not the only podcast with the label of the European Year of Cultural Heritage. And I know that because I have another podcast in Italian with a great co-host, Gianluca Verlingeri. The podcast is called Banda Critica. Bandacritica.it or com is the... I mean, you can go to both. It's not that I don't know which one it is. And that podcast is also part of the European Year of of cultural heritage. So this was my self-promotion moment. And I would like to ask you, uh, do I have your permission to keep using the hashtag Europe for culture all the way into 2019 every time I release new episodes for both podcasts? Yes, absolutely. Actually, we are we encourage you to, to do it so because it's also part of the legacy of the year and and uh, the idea is not to end the shoot down projects, you know, in the the thirty first of December of two thousand eighteen. Of course, it's quite the opposite, and and uh, yes, I'm very happy that uh, that the podcast is uh, using the the label. I would like to thank you so much for your time, Lorena. I'm happy we got a chance to talk about this initiative. I'm happy I got to learn more about it. And of course, I'm happy and proud to be part of it with the podcast. I invite everybody listening to go to the internet, to this particular website and check the event near them and keep using the hashtag. Of course, most importantly... The purpose is not to use the hashtag, but it's to go out there and engage with our cultural heritage, participate, be active, connect. And people are always the most important thing. It's not about the thing, it's the community. So I very much marry the spirit of this initiative. It also resonates so much with what this podcast is about and my research work as well. So I'm very glad that we got together today and we got to talk about this great initiative, the European Year of Cultural Heritage, our heritage, where the past meets the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>